Welcome to today's webinar in the Keep America Beautiful webinar series, Ending Litter, Policies and Practices That Work. Today's discussion will focus on community solutions. I'm Jason Smith, Regional Director for the Western Region for Keep America Beautiful, and I will soon introduce our panelists, Noah Ullman, Chief Marketing Officer, Keep America Beautiful, Joe Judice, Assistant Public Works Director, City of Phoenix, Sarah Nichols, Program Director for Keep Texas Beautiful, and Mallory Coffey, Keep South Carolina Beautiful State Leader, to discuss solutions and policies to aid communities in their work to tackle litter and quality of life issues. On behalf of Keep America Beautiful and our 700 national affiliates, I would like to thank you for joining us today. The Keep America Beautiful mission is to inspire and educate people from all different backgrounds to take action every day to improve and beautify their community environment. As part of that work, we have been leading a webinar series designed to convene discussions to accelerate on the transition to zero waste within our community, our cities, towns, and rural communities. In this next three-part series, we'll focus on litter, the trash on our streets and in our waterways, parks, and other spaces that continues to plague many American communities. In this series, you will learn about litter in America, facts, trends, and emerging opportunities, policies and programs that are working to end litter, how efforts to end litter are working not only to beautify communities, but also to unify neighbors to act together to advance shared values. Before we begin our discussion, I have a few housekeeping notes for today's webinar. To ask questions, please use the question panel on your screen and we will try to address them at the end of the webinar. Noah will be facilitating this session and will wrap up with an opportunity for Q&A at the conclusion and will tell you more about our upcoming webinars and how to register. And now let me introduce Noah Ullman, Chief Marketing Officer, Keep America Beautiful. Thanks, Jason. And thank uh, each and every one of you for joining us today. I'm really pleased to be here with our experts representing communities in Texas, South Carolina, and Phoenix, Arizona, as well as each of these experts having some perspective on national issues. Keep America Beautiful has been fighting litter since our founding in 1953. Over the past several decades, we've learned some things. One of those things and core to our work is that to truly address these large societal problems, it requires everyone at the table. Just passing blame and saying it's not my problem does not get as far as a society. As they say, if you're not part of the problem, if you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. This is true with litter, which we define as unmanaged solid waste and littering, the act, the human act of carelessness that damages communities and the environment. To really solve this problem, and it's a big problem, the Keep America Beautiful 2020 National Litter Study just identify that there are over 50 billion pieces of litter on the ground. And just to put that in perspective, that's about 152 pieces of litter for every person in America. Success of that scale requires a tri-sector partnership. We need to be engaged with business, government, and the community. This approach has proven effective to create actionable solutions for some of the world's largest problems. Keep America Beautiful, our 700 affiliates, and the millions of volunteers who support our work are part of the community solution. We also work closely with businesses and corporate America to help create and deliver programs to improve communities. Today, I'm thrilled to speak with our state affiliate leaders about how they work with their state and local governments. And in the case of Joe, who is in the public works department in the city of Phoenix, how he works with civic organizations like Keep Phoenix Beautiful. For any policy to be effective, it needs to serve its constituents well. And I'm really curious to find out that the similarities and differences between the diverse perspectives of our panelists. With that, I'm gonna quickly introduce our guests and get right to your questions. Um, Joe, Joe Gidis has, been an, has extensive experience as an executive leader of various municipal programs, including solid waste, fleet services, environmental programs, and facilities management. In July 2017, Joe was selected to serve the city of Phoenix 
as Assistant Public Works Director, responsible for all solid waste programs and services. A primary focus for Joe is supporting the Reimagine Phoenix Initiative, which is focused on developing a circular economy wherein the solid waste resources people discard are recovered and remanufactured into new products promoting waste diversion, resource preservation, and economic development. Joe also serves as the chair of the Solid Waste Technical Committee of the American Public Works Association, also known as APWA. Sarah Nichols joined Keep Texas Beautiful in December of 2017. As program director, she supports community affiliate members, executes KTB and KAB programs, and works to grow strategic statewide partnerships. Prior to joining Keep Texas Beautiful, Sarah spent more than six years with the State of Texas Alliance for Recycling, also known as STAR, most recently as their executive director. Sarah holds a BA from the University of Houston and has a background in communications, solid waste management, programs management, and nonprofit leadership. She loves to travel and spend time outdoors, hiking and camping. So environment is really important to Sarah. Merrily Coffee works for Palmetto Pride, South Carolina's nonprofit focused on eradicating litter as the Keep South Carolina Beautiful State Leader and Community Outreach Program Manager. She also serves as the Vice President for Keep America Beautiful State Leaders Council. Since her arrival at the KSCB State Leader in 2017, she has grown the affiliate network by nearly 10 affiliates. Before starting in her current position, she created the local award-winning affiliate Keep Bamberg County Beautiful. Mary is, uh, Mallory is a graduate of the University of South Carolina of State with a BA in nonprofit leadership and will soon start her MA in organizational leadership at Columbia College in the fall. When she is not helping local governments and affiliates solve issues to litter, you can find her on her farm raising black Angus cattle. So uh, our first question, I think, uh, is likely on the top of everybody's mind, especially with the, the, the recent identification of 50 billion pieces of litter on the ground in America. Uh, and I'm gonna start with Joe here. What, is, what does success look like to you when it comes to addressing litter? Uh, <clears throat> good morning or good afternoon, I guess, for most. It's still morning for me here in Arizona. Um, and thank you for having me. Uh, greatly appreciate being here. Uh, you know, a really excellent question. I think that we are all very passionate about the problem of litter. And I think if we were all honest with ourselves, we, you know, we would want that perfect solution where there would be no such thing as litter. And that's certainly um, a wonderful goal to strive for. I think though we need to recognize that you know, we can strive for perfection, but if we're achieving uh, steps in that direction where we're reducing litter, um, that's, those are accomplishments that we can be proud of. And I know that for us in Phoenix uh, and uh, through the American Public Works Association, as I talk to many of the other municipalities and counties around the country, um, when we feel like we were taking steps backwards in certain areas, that's where we get, you know, of course, frustrated and, and want to talk about how, um, you know, how we can, where we need to make program adjustments to reflect that. So, you know, a couple of examples um, is that one of the ones I know that we're struggling with in Phoenix and other cities are is the problem of homelessness and how um, with homelessness, we have um, littering impacts in, in our communities that frustrate our residents um, and, and there's expectations to deal with that. That's something we need to deal with as a nation, for example. And then the other thing I just like to point out again, because we're so passionate about this, I find myself saying this, so I imagine many of you on this webinar would feel the same way. Um, lit, litter and littering are a little bit of two different things if you wanna think about it that way. So, you know, we certainly get upset about the act of littering where someone's just intentionally discarding something into the public without regard. Uh, but we do have to recognize, and I think as we all take personal responsibility for picking up a piece of litter, whether we put it there or not, right, that litter happens unintentionally as well. Um, it's not always with malicious intent. 
and that um, so we all just need to be committed and do our part. Those would be a few things I would share. Thanks, Joe. That that um you know that leads me to something I've heard Sarah say a couple times uh, that the solution to litter is a three-legged stool. Can you can you talk a little bit more about that for us? Sure. Um, so I think your question about how do we actually measure success, what does success look like, is really interesting. Uh, for a long time, I think organizations like KTB really came out with their report cards and were like, we did this many cleanups and picked up more trash than ever. And to me, success looks like we did this many cleanups and our trash is decreasing that we're picking up over time. Um, and speaking to that three-legged stool, so really looking at you know what infrastructure is out there to capture and prevent um, solid waste from being mismanaged, uh, what education is out there to inform people that this infrastructure exists and this is how you utilize that, and then what policy is out there to either incentivize people to properly manage waste or to um, you know, point out those bad actors that aren't properly doing that. Um, that's my three-legged stool. And then just kind of thinking about how you mentioned, Noah, that litter really is mismanaged solid waste. So litter is just one part of this overall comprehensive system of solid waste. And so how do we kind of shift from this cradle to grave mentality and really look at how we're utilizing these resources throughout their entire life cycle so that they are beneficial um, for, you know, along every step of the way for that solid waste system, so. Thanks, Sarah. That actually, um, uh, I, I love that context and, and thank you for raising policy as an issue. It's the title of this, this webinar. And I, I wanna get into kind of the, the local, uh, the, the importance of really being effective uh, and, and attuned to the local community. So for Mallory, in, in your experience, how do, you, how do you ground these solutions in local context and, and build relationships at the local, uh, at the local level? that influence policy to serve our common goals? Sure, so I think it's really important to first, I mean, you have to, when you think of success, what um, one county or city might see as successful might not be successful for another area. Number one, because of manpower, uh, funds, and other resources that might be available to that community. So when we talk about success, uh, we first have to understand the area, understand what they have as resources, what's available to them, and then what they lack. And then from there, we have to say, okay, well, what is your litter issue? Is your litter issue, even though, yes, it's all mismanaged solid waste, is the majority of it coming from uncovered loads? Or is it intentional litter from not having a trash can on the sidewalk at a certain transition point? Um, or is it just not having enough litter enforcement? Um, that's what we do here in South Carolina. We look at a four-pronged approach that covers awareness, pickup, education, and enforcement. And we go into a community, find out what they like, and then develop a plan that fits them locally. That way they're not overburdened with um, reaching expectations that they would never be able to reach in the first place. Start small and then go big. It allows them to build that foundation so they can be more successful in the future. Um, and also, you know, a lot like with recycling, you know, it changes every day from like, you know, city to county to state to national to global, uh, globally. So if you start small, it allows the citizens to better understand what is happening so they can adapt their lives to the new policies or procedures that are happening locally. And that will also, in the end, change behaviors of littering or um, whatever else you're focusing on. Thanks for uh, you know, that. That behavior change is really core to what we do at Keep America Beautiful. So it becomes a, a permanent solution. Thank you. Thank you for that, Mallory. Joe, I'm going to pivot back to you. Um, you know, given that importance of really understanding the local context uh, and, and someone that, that works for and in a, a, a large city. Um, in, a, in a state that's growing very rapidly. Can you talk about the balance between, uh, you know, the, what, what's right for Phoenix and the relationship with the state of Arizona to, to get an idea of that at a policy level, the relationship between uh, uh, cities and or communities and, and their states? Well, uh, yeah, that's um, a bit of a loaded question, I think. <laughs> um, so when it comes to, what, what I can say is this, when it comes to the policy of managing 
litter, managing waste. Um, you know, I, I feel like the state of Arizona and the city of Phoenix are very policy aligned. Uh, there may be some unique differences in certain areas. Phoenix um, is the largest um, city in the country that is a uh, manager council form of government. Um, all the other cities larger than us. So we are the fifth largest city in the country. All the other larger cities have a strong mayor form of government where it's, you know, it's the mayor's kind of running the city. Um, here it's a mayor and council and, and the city manager really administers the city. We work closely with the state. Um, the state's done a really, uh, state of Arizona done a, a really good job on um, doing litter cleanup programs. Uh, just talking more locally though, we've got a great relationship with our Keep Phoenix Beautiful affiliate here. Um, we work very collaboratively on a lot of efforts, um, whether they be cleanup efforts uh, or whether they be uh, recycling collection efforts, things like that, and education program efforts. So I'm, I'm incredibly proud of that partnership. And, and I would encourage that uh, cities across the country um, could very well have collaborative working relationships with uh, Keep Phoenix, Keep America Beautiful affiliates uh, locally to accomplish their mission. Uh, very much I have written up on, on my board, right? One of our, as a solid waste utility, our primary objective is to maintain the health and safety of Phoenicians now and for the future. And very much the for the future part is I think critically important because what we do is about sustainability. And, um, and I did wanna, there's a few comments in here. I just wanted to note, I really um, like Brian Nixon's um, comment here because I think it really talks to the personal responsibility aspect where he says his personal mantra is, it may not be my trash, but it's still my planet. And I, I, that's really what I feel like as public servants, um, we have that role, like we, we are public servants. So we, we know it's our responsibility to do a public good. Um, we need our individual citizens to recognize it's also their role to do part the public good. And I think that's really an important um, aspect that if we can all take away some of that personal responsibility of doing a public good, um, that's really beneficial. Um, so I hope I answered your question Noah, if, if there's something else you want me to specifically articulate on, I'm happy to do that. Yeah, no, that's great, Joe. Thanks. We're going we're gonna to kind of dance around this issue a lot because there's a balance between, uh, you know, I actually like that you referenced that comment. We, we are all, we all live on this, you know, rock hurtling through space and we're all members of communities and there are structures in place, right, between the, the grand earth, you know, everyone uh, on the planet and, and your neighborhood. Uh, and I think aligning what's right for the planet, the country, city, state, community is, is really important because it engages and activates uh, people at a, at a very local level. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna go to Mallory uh, to, to dig a little bit deeper into that. In a state like South Carolina and, and with your affiliates, how do, you, how do you balance the resources and capacity of different organizations at the local level and I realize that money is always, you know, uh, uh, an, in, uh, uh, an energy, right? That, that allows people to do more, but it's, it's not really just about money. It's about, it's about developing that sense of responsibility and, uh, and community pride. And I'm wondering how you find that balance within South Carolina. Sure. So one of the first things we do, um, cause at Palmetto Pride, you know, that's, it's the nonprofit for the entire state that how is a keep oh, goodness gracious keep South Carolina beautiful is a division of Palm Enterprise. So we don't just do like affiliate things. We our main focus is litter. So whenever we go into a community, we just ask very upfront questions and we ask those individuals whether they are citizens, um, law enforcement officers, code officers, litter officers, elected officials. We ask them to honestly answer our questions. You know. Um, if you had X amount of dollars, could you do this? Well, more than likely the answer is going to be yes, because when you have money, 
you have the ability to do those things. But if you don't have money, for example, and there are no grants available, it might be rewriting um, a litter law um, or a policy that would allow uh, other employees to come in and help uh, host cleanup events. It's really looking at, at what you have and realizing if there's a gap here, is there a gap somewhere else in another department um, or in a local business or in a nonprofit organization locally that could help fill this role for us? You know, you said earlier, Noah, it's that tri-sector partnership. You have to have the social, the government, and the business sectors working together because that is the only way any of these solutions are going to be answered and handled correctly. Um, so at the end of the day, to, to sum all this up, it's being completely aware of what you can handle, um, having hope for what you think you can do, and then finding solutions um, through an open-minded concept throughout your entire community where all the members can come together. And when you figure that out, everything does balance out. It may take some time to work through the kinks, um, but when you have all those three sectors coming together, that's what we push for here at Palmetto Pride and Keep South Carolina Beautiful. Um, those, those sectors coming together to address our four-pronged approach to find that solution. Thanks, Mallory. I'm gonna I'm gonna go to Sarah now, and you in a, in a slightly different perspective, right? With a with a very large state, with some very large cities, and also some rural areas. How do you how in a in in your role at Keep Texas Beautiful? How do you use uh, data and information to help inform what's right for those communities? Which you're building on on what Mallory said is a key to success. Oh my goodness, I could talk about data all day long, <laughs> but. I, I want to build on what Mallory was saying in, in that uh, a lot of these groups are grassroots initiatives. KTV has its, uh, you know, its history in grassroots initiatives, and that's really great. That does put a lot of, um, you know, efforts on the individuals. I think individual responsibility is really great, but it's a bell curve, right? And so there are people that just do not care about litter. That is not a priority for them, either because they have other priorities or because of political nature or whatever else. That's something that we see in Texas a lot. Um, litter has kind of been seen and recycling and kind of solid waste management has been seen as this environmental political push and something that we are trying to communicate with our affiliates is that these issues are larger than just litter, um, than just mismanaged waste. And so that litter means that, you know, this business may not want to come and, you know, start a business in your downtown area or whatever else next to that truck stop that's particularly littered. Um, that litter means potential less jobs and less tax revenue. That litter means that maybe that park is not as safe for the families and the kids. So really trying to connect that those dots for our affiliates is really important. And that's where data can be really important. A lot of that data does exist and a lot of that data is um, starting to become more important and in, in the forefront of people. Uh, we are looking at uh, data in a more, um, I guess, specific lens where we've had great data all along that we know how many pounds or how many bags we've picked up of litter, but um, what are we cleaning up? And what does that mean for the messaging? What does that mean for potential policy? Um, and, and in order to have a good argument for that, especially in a state like Texas, we have to have good data. We have to have data that shows that that means um, you know, lost revenue for cities, that that means jobs, that that means safety, whatever else. Um, so data to us is really, really important. And I think it's something that will continue to be a focus area and will continue to grow over the years to come. I, uh, yeah, thanks for that, Sarah. I've been I've been known to say litter is both the smallest and the largest problem at the same time. That there's a there's this kind of ripple effect of having a littered community and it's and the impact on that community as a whole. Uh, which leads me to a question uh, for Joe. Um, in a in a city that's growing as fast as Phoenix is, can you talk to me about some emerging problems with either litter or illegal dumping? Uh, and how you manage new problems compared to problems that you have more experience with, like you know, regular you know household or or commercial solid waste management. And I, you know, I'm thinking kind of specifically here about um, you know litter that's related to unhoused populations, which you mentioned you mentioned earlier. 
Yeah, thanks. Yeah, this gets to what I was hinting at a little bit uh, earlier. I think, you know, just talking about some of the positive trends real quickly, you, I think I've, you've, I've seen a reduction in what I'd call like fugitive litter, where I feel like um, whether it's trash haulers or residents that are taking their materials somewhere uh, to either recycle them or dispose of them or whatever, um, our, our laws or efforts to educate people about covering their loads, making, securing their loads. I feel like, you know, we've had positive improvements there over the last 20 years. That message has gotten out. That improvement has happened. I think that getting um, solid waste organizations to police their areas, you know, the roads around their areas, you know, there, there's been, been improvement there. The couple of areas where I alluded to earlier, I've seen, you know, a, a regression, uh, at least here locally. And I, I hear this through my role at APWA that it's a problem in other communities. I, I pointed out to the, to the issue of homelessness and, and there just is the reality of uh, the, the, there is either material that they have that they just leave a laying around or there is the act of going through the garbage looking for aluminum containers or something else and typically or frequently those materials are just left strewn um, around. And that is a real problem for, for many urban areas to, to cope with. Uh, then the other issue is I, I've unfortunately seen a growing problem of the act, the intentional act of illegally dumping material. This tends to be more large debris. So I'm moving out of my apartment and I just decide I'm going to dump my old couch and, uh, you know, a coffee table in an alley, you know, just someone else will take care of it. You know, that seems to be the philosophy. Someone else will, you know, take care of this problem. And, and so for us, from a strategy perspective, it's, um, you know, whenever we can catch someone, we're making, uh, we're, we're taking an enforcement action. And Frankly, I will turn them over to the, the news media if, if we've got video footage and let them make an issue of it because we want people to know this. They know it's wrong. They already know what they're doing is wrong. So we want other people to see, look, you, you know, if you're going to do this. There's, there's a risk. You're going to get caught and pay a fine. But those are two frustratingly growing trends that I've seen, again, here locally. But I think this is more of a national problem um, that's happening. And, and we need to, uh, again, so that's intentional, right? Th those are intentional acts by people. And, um, and so the messaging, we need to work on the messaging um, that, you know, not only is there punishment for that, but gosh, you should just not behave in this way. Uh, thank you. And I, actually that leads me right to uh, another question that came from the audience. Uh, I'm gonna direct to Mallory. What, what is the role of enforcement in litter laws and how can we make them both effective and equitable uh, so they don't target certain groups or uh, you know, are kind of distributed unfairly when, when the uh, laws do get enforced? And I know that, I know that sure. you, you do a lot of work in South Carolina and I, I, I'm also curious as to how you're working with law enforcement to make enforcement of litter laws and policies uh, a priority? Sure. So one thing that we recently did in South Carolina is change our litter laws. And we hear this all the time with what I'm about to say to you. We lowered the fines for the litter laws. Um, and when we say that, people think, well, no, 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 no. You need to lock them up or you need to do this or you need to do that. Um, but what we realize is that adjudication is a big issue in South Carolina when it comes to litter. You know, when you get caught, you know, if an officer is even lucky in the first place to actually see the litter happen in front of uh, them, uh, from there, you know, you go to court, say it's a cigarette butt, okay, um, you end up paying more than a thousand dollars for that, and, you know, it, the act of it happening, yes, it is wrong, 
But when you get to court and you're in front of the judge and the judge feels bad and has sympathy for you in that situation, even though that that person knows that what they did is wrong, what the the judge knows, and even the officer and other people there, they know that it's wrong, you know, a thousand dollars to someone who doesn't have that money in the first place, that's a really big deal. So we thought we would see all these tickets just that were just thrown out. And then another issue that we had is that when um, when it comes to adjudication of these laws, there was no proof. Like some magistrates throughout South Carolina, they might say, well, if you can bring me a piece, like if someone dumped a bag of MSW household trash and their name showed up on a piece of paper in that trash bag three different times, yes, it's theirs. Um, other ones would say, well, if you didn't see them do it, if you don't have like a video or still images like back to back to back dated time stamped, sorry, I'm not, I'm going to throw this out. Um, so with Palmetto Pride, we have a camera loan program that we will teach code officers, litter officers, or any officer, because our state law allows any officer in South Carolina to write on the statute. We'll teach you how to put up cameras. We'll loan the cameras to you. So you don't have to go out and buy this and then wonder, oh man, did I just spend thousands of dollars on this? And I don't know if it's going to work for me. Um, so we'll come out, teach you how to use the cameras, put them up, give you recommendations. Uh, we'll help you buy them through our grants if that's what you need to. And then from there, it allows you to target kind of what Sarah was saying before, specific data related to things. So, for example, I'm sure that this is something that everyone has issues with tires. In South Carolina, people love to dump tires illegally. And that goes back to a policy as well, which means that, well, um, from the dismantler or to someone who changes tires at home and just has an ample amount of them, how do I dispose of them properly? So that's an entire another policy that, like what Sarah said earlier, I could talk about tires all day long with you guys. Um, but what you have to understand is the law needs to be specific towards the items that are dumped, and then the fines and the punishment need to be able to very easily be associated with the action that was done. Um, Another thing that happened with our litter laws is that if you were caught littering, now you have to perform community service. And it's not community service of any kind. You have to go pick up litter on the side of the road. And it is not mandated that you have to have someone watch you in the law. So, you know, that, that's really great. And like Joe was saying before, I don't know what it is about people who just want to, they want to go out and dump like a whole freezer of, you know, items or like a whole truckload of tires. I mean, it's it's a disaster for the community. It, it slows down economic development and just it's a pain for anyone and everyone to deal with. So when we see these illegal dumping issues and we know what can happen, that's, it, it, it enables us to go into the community, find the problem, associate a new policy, in this case, a law to help correct it. And then, um, like Joe said, you know, we use social media, we go on the news if we have to, and really educate the public and make them aware of this is why this is wrong. This is what will happen when you're caught, and you're going to get caught, and then you're going to be punished, and then you go from there. I, I, have, uh, I have a comment and a, and a follow-up question, and then I'll get to Sarah in a minute. I, I, the comment is, it, you know, one of those unintended consequences of litter uh, are actually those those discarded tires because they become great breeding grounds for mosquitoes, which have been carrying really dangerous diseases and affecting large populations. So I'm sure the person that dropped the tire, you know, by the side of the road didn't want to get, you know, give give uh, uh, give their community Zika, but it's it's uh, uh, it is it is an, a possible consequence of of spreading something like West Nile uh, through through litter. Um, I, I want to, there's a follow-up question that came in, Mallory. Do you have a sense of what that balance is? And we're going to talk about balance with Sarah in just a minute. Uh, what that balance is between, uh, you know, a fine that is, um, sends a message, but is also reasonable enough to be enforced and not thrown out. I think, Noah, that that's what our recent litter law did. Um, you know, everything across the board was at one thing. And so now it goes by weight. So if you throw a cigarette butt out, you know, that's a $25 fine. 
you know, and if you're caught, it's just like a seatbelt ticket in South Carolina. If you get enough of them, you realize very quickly it's it's going to hit the pocketbook <laughs> rather quickly. Now, if you get caught for illegal dumping, the fines jump, whoo, they skyrocket, and as do the number of hours that you have to provide community service. Um, and I think that that was the biggest issue before, right, that, that you were speaking about just finding that balance between what is effective to teach a lesson, but what is actually going to work. It's one thing to um, to have a fine, but if you can't enforce it, why have it to begin with? And that's really important that, you know, when we were doing this, not only were we using data from the magistrate's office and cleanups that we were doing, we worked with the South Carolina Litter Control Association, another nonprofit division of uh, Palmetto Pride, these officers were giving us firsthand accounts and we were tracking it of what the issue was. And so we were able to then work with our legislators to say, hey, we know that this is an issue. Help us find that balance. This is what we think. So it's, again, going back to that tri-sector partnership. So you've got the nonprofit, you've got the local government, okay? And then you have businesses who are also saying this is hindering the economic development of this area. And then we were able to find a balanced solution that worked. And um, we've been very uh, proud to see what has happened since then. So. That's great. Thanks, Mallory. So Sarah, we've, we've heard, uh, you know, we've kind of glossed on a lot of different uh, tools in our tool chest to fight litter. We've got policy, policy enforcement, uh, infrastructure, education. Um, what what's the you know and again in a state like texas which is really fascinating because it's so big but it also i think holds three of the top 10 largest cities in the country uh what is is there a um is one one of those tools more important than another or how do you find balance is there a magic mix that you've seen that that works for communities across texas as it relates to uh litter policy and enforcement and ultimately beautiful communities Sure. Um, so I'm going to talk to a process that we conducted with about more than 100 stakeholders of ours. So going back to that tri-sector um, you know, group of, of stakeholders, we were talking to cities, KCB affiliates, KAB affiliates, NGOs, um, and, and state government uh, officials about you know, what could work? What would your residents want to see? Um, what would your elected officials buy into? And what we heard from um, that series of meetings, which took place in 2020 during the pandemic virtually, where you know, especially PPE litter is on the top of everyone's mind, health and safety is on the top of everyone's mind. No one wants more litter because so-and-so could have spit on it and it may have COVID, you know, especially in the beginning of the pandemic, we had no idea. Um, and what we heard from those stakeholders was that they would be more willing to buy into an incentive program versus um, something that was, you know, a fee, a fine, um, a tax uh, that they would have to then pass on to their residents. So, uh, we were really looking at um, rebate programs and trying to endorse uh, state policy that uh, reflected what our stakeholders wanted to see more of. And I think that that's something that we are going to continue to see more of in the future via rebate systems for certain materials, bottle bills, et cetera. Um, it is something that has been shown to work in other areas. Um, and then something on the enforcement side as well, uh, I wanted to point out what Ector County in Texas is doing. They are kind of far west um, Texas, very rural, but also very oil and gas focused, have huge issues with illegal dumping, real, real nasty illegal dumping. Um, and they've been very proactive in training their, um, their police and, and law enforcement in illegal dumping issues and how to um, catch illegal dumpers and, and what is considered illegal dumping, which is not something from my understanding that is done often in training for law enforcement and trying to um, get the message across that oftentimes if someone is legal, Ill illegally dumping, that can lead to, you know, more convictions. So it's kind of opening the door for, um, you know, for that enforcement for other things that are maybe not litter or illegal dumping uh related and they were able to do that by creating a task force an environmental task force and 
really taking a regional approach that worked really well for that rural uh, part of the state. Thank you for that. Um, Joe, I'm going to I'm going to point this next question to you in, as both your role in the city of Phoenix and uh, your role uh, at a national level with uh, APWA. Do you, do you what are your thoughts on on kind of tuning policies or messaging for uh, different cultural groups and how do you work within multicultural communities? Oh, that is. Uh... Fantastic question. I do, it does um, make me think about just a recent personal experience that tells me that messaging, I think, can work if done right. That's for sure. So I'm a fairly frequent visitor to our um, national forests, and they typically have the, you know, you'll see at the trailheads, you know, pack it in, pack it out. And, and I just did about in like a nine and a half mile hike up in, uh, Northern Arizona and our beautiful pine forest, didn't see a single piece of litter um, on that hike. Although at the very end, I, I had uh, came across a couple of beer bottles that I suspect a few teenagers may have uh, left out on, a, on an evening and just picked those up and took those out with me. But so, so that the right messaging can work. Uh, I, I believe, I believe um, that with the right messaging, it, it makes a point. Like. I, I've done a lot of camping as well, and whether it's even in an improved campground or an unimproved area just off in the, in the forest, people in that culture understand their obligation. Yeah, they make trash, but they take it out with them and they'll pick up something they see behind that might have been left by another camper even. And if that, if that can happen, I think we can do that. With regard to the various cultures, you know, Phoenix has um, not the melting pot of New York City, uh, where I grew up, but we do have um, some significant diverse populations. We have, um, you know, larger Hispanic communities. Um, we have, you know, other varieties of communities. And we frankly are still trying to figure out how to hone that messaging. Um, where, you know, your different cultures come up with different, you know, priorities and different messaging. And, and we've struggled, for example, on the recycling messaging for different communities. And we have, uh, you know, we have parts of our city where, you know, we're probably, you know, achieving clean recyclables, you know, with less than 10% things in the recycling cart that don't belong. And then we have other parts where it's, 50, 60% garbage in the recycling cart. And we've been trying this messaging for 20 years. So I don't wanna to pretend to say I have an answer yet because we just, what I will say is you, you don't give up um, on the effort. Our most recent effort is to work with uh, Arizona State University and their behavioral research groups and try to identify with them what, what are some uh, behavioral scientific research methodologies we can um, research and, and try ta to target to see what the right messaging is for those. So we, we won't surrender, um, but it's an ongoing effort. Definitely something to be very thoughtful though and mindful about that that, that is um, something you need to be considering. Yeah, uh, very similar question, which I'm gonna ask uh, each of you to address uh, if you can, uh, of a, like a generational gap, right? I think uh, we certainly see that, um, you know, younger generations, school age kids are really passionate about the environment and their community and wanting to keep things clean. And they also spend a lot of time outside in their neighborhoods. So they have an awareness, uh, but then, you know, uh, people grow up and teenagers become a little bit defiant and there seems to be a, a you know, a period of, Call it apathy, and in, in, you know, in, in, in a lot of the twenty and thirty year olds, um, are you doing anything in in your communities to specifically address that particular gap of these uh, uh, members of your communities that are fairly high level consumers but are known not to really manage their their uh, trash well? Um, and I'll I'll start with Mallory, and then and we'll go back to Sarah and Joe for that same question. Sure. Um, no, I think that your question is a great question, but you have to, whenever you think about that um, and you're at a state level, you have to think, 
well, is someone in Cherokee County going to behave the same way as they do in Horry County? Um, you know, they're on the completely different opposite sides of the state, um, very different types of income, um, and very different individuals in each one, um, even if that generation is the same. Um, I think that what you have to do is use a tool that we use all the time um, that Keep America Beautiful gave us is the litter index. Um, and it's something that we push, not just for affiliates, but we have this opportunity. So like people who get pilot program grants from us, we say, this is how you determine what is wrong when it comes to litter in your community. Um, and it's not just about you know, that score of a one to four, okay? It might be, okay, well, if we go, and we see that this road is a four, we might get out, do a litter pickup in that area. And then from there, you might see the types of products that these generations are buying because they are such high consumers. And then from there, you can say, okay, well, how is the best way to communicate with them at this point? Um, you know, in a rural county, it might be social media, it might be the local newspaper, or it might be the local grocery store. But if you go to a really busy area um, in the upstate, maybe somewhere even, you know, in the low country, um, and you're competing for people's attention, you might have to get really creative about how you're contacting them. Um, so it goes back to understanding what the problem is, um, what type of litter it is, what causes that littering behavior to happen, and then figuring out what can I do locally with these tri-sector partnerships to get this approach out into the community that will ultimately change the behavior, um, tweak the behavior, or just overall you know, go in and do whatever we need to do for this specific generation. Um, and that only comes through developing relationships with community members and um, from the state level to the local level, but also at the local level, like these individuals need to have relationships with these citizens and understand why they do the things that they do. Um, you know, Sarah mentioned this earlier, and I, I very briefly, I want to touch on it. Um, some people, whenever we do litter cleanups, like I'm, I'm from Bamberg, South Carolina, uh, one of the smallest areas in the entire state, very poor community. And every time we did a litter pickup, we never talked about litter. We talked about the problems that they had at home. And I feel like sometimes when people litter, um, that they're not thinking, period. Like, yes, they know that it's wrong, but they're more concerned with another issue that's going on in their lives. Um, my husband works in the water utility industry, and I hear him say all the time, people don't worry about not having water till they go to turn it on and it's not there. And to me, when we think about litter and the other pillars of Keep America Beautiful and even the approach of the Palmetto Pride, we have to understand and develop those relationships with our citizens because that determines at the end of the day why they are doing anything that they do. And if we don't understand that, we will never change any policy, whether it's litter, whether it's dealing with some other political issue that we have, you have to know the citizen, whether they're volunteering with you or not. If you want a policy to be effective, you have to know why people are behaving the way that they are and then go from there. Uh, yeah, Matt, you know, I think you did a really good job of, of, of correcting the question, right? I heard really clearly you can't create a whole category of people in an age group or, or uh, you know, by any other uh, uh, demographic or, or um, any, other, any other segmentation. Uh, but I, I am going to pivot that question a little bit with Sarah. Is there anything that you found at a state level uh, in Texas that has uh, either more or less uh, uh, effectiveness you know, results within certain demographics that you can share with a group? Or is it really what Mallory said that you have to, you have to get into the heads of each individual local community and understand their issues? And, and the argument I actually heard Mallory say is that the policies should really be supported, but but guided by community, community making work. Yeah, so Texas is a huge state. We are very rural and we are also home to some of the largest cities in the United States. So we kind of run the gamut as far as our um, audience and, and who our residents are. Um, we are also a coastal city, so we have a lot of waterways, or coastal states, sorry, so we have a lot of waterways. Um, so 
you know, while consistent messaging and consistent education, I think is really important. And, and we do have that. We've had that through the Don't Mess With Texas campaign. Someone in the questions, um, you know, mentioned it. I don't know that that necessarily resonates with most people and especially maybe the younger generation. Um, I, I don't know that they know don't mess with Texas means actually don't let or not don't mess with our guns or whatever else. Um, so I would uh, encourage people to look more specifically at some of the um, trouble spots. And that's where data I think is really, really important. So um, I'll talk about two programs that we've launched recently, one of them being the Texas Litter Database, uh, which will be the first uh, single repository for litter data in Texas. So um, we've typically kept data for what our affiliates have done or anyone who's received cleanup supplies or registered an event with us. This really gives us the opportunity to collect data from um, any organization who is doing anything in regards to litter. And hopefully it's um, more quality data, better data. So we know not only how much is being collected, but what is being collected. So if we can show that, you know, there's a bunch of diapers, for instance, <laughs> that are being collected in one particular neighborhood, how can we create or, you know, help the people who are working on educational campaigns, how can they create better, more robust um, campaigns that do target that one specific commodity um, or that one specific park. Uh, so really trying to hone down into what data we are actually collecting and get better quality data so that we can get better policy, better programs, better education out there. Um, something else that I will touch on that um, was less, is maybe more fun than data, <laughs> um, is that you know we were able to launch what we call the Young Texan Ambassador Program um, earlier this year at the beginning of the year. And we did that um, to really try to reach this age, this generation of kids that like, we really don't know what they're doing or what they like or what they, you know, we kind of point to social media as a um, solution for everything. And, and that probably isn't necessarily working as well as it could. So hopefully through that ambassador program, we were equipping um, kids aged 15 to 25, so kind of all over the place when it comes to youth, um, all sorts of experiences from all over the states to then become ambassadors in their community and with their families, with their friends, their networks, their schools, whatever else, um, and try to reach some of those people that aren't necessarily that choir that we're preaching to on a regular basis. Um, because when we're out there at Earth Day events or whatever it might be, these are people that know that littering is bad. They're probably not littering unless something accidentally flies out of their car or whatever else. So um, how do we reach those folks that, you know, this isn't a priority. It's not something that they think about. And um, maybe that's through, you know, these, these ambassadors that we're able to equip with good, uh, good information um, to pass along to folks who aren't part of that choir. Thank you. Uh, Joe, same, same question, but with a pivot of, uh, you know, what are you seeing in a, your, your, your scope is, is scales a little different at a, at a city level, even though Phoenix is a very large city. Um, are you seeing certain messaging that works better with certain demographics uh, than others? And um, I actually think what Sarah touched on was really interesting there. Are you seeing any um, item focused uh, campaigns or messaging that is, that is really effective uh, in, in addressing unmanaged solid waste in Phoenix? Um, I think there, there definitely are un, unique opportunities um, to message differently. And sometimes it's uh, through different organizations, right? So um, first off, there's a quite an, a decent number of community groups that have formed that. Um, so for example, in, in our Maryvale community, um, there are, it's a, it's a fairly larger Hispanic population. We have a lot of, it's an older community. So a lot of the services are in, in the alleys and there's been a lot of, and that's a public right of way, just picture, you know, a couple of, you know, walls up and an alleyway and people just uh, are, you know, doing things in that alleyway that are problematic for the residents. And, you know, it's, it's a public safety issue because, criminals or accessing people's yards through the alleys. Uh, but it's also a litter issue. It's a, it's a illegal dumping issue. We have organizations that we're working with um, that are 
aggressively trying to clean up those alleys. As a matter of fact, uh, we're working very closely with several of our council districts now on a program to start to close services in those alleys and gate them at the request of the residents, moving you know, the services that can be moved curbside and, and the utility services that need to remain in the alley you know, uh, whether that's, let's say, let's say there's water lines in the alley, well, they can just access through the gate when they have to do any work on the water lines, or if there's, let's say there's utility services like electric power or Cox communication services or whatever, they can access through the gate, but we remove the other services there so we can kind of close those alleys. So there are definitely different ways. Um, another way, we do a lot of obviously community events. Our, our city's neighborhood services department has a lot of neighborhood groups and meetings, and that's an opportunity for us to connect and, and, and do cleanup events in coordination with those community groups, even, um, um, even groups that are like block watch groups that are really focused on public safety, but they are also an avenue to um, clean up activities. And then, um, you know, there's, there's some through cultural groups, church communities, where um, you can get to people through those ways. So you really, there's not a one answer solution is what it really comes down to. You really need to have a multi-tooled approach. And that's why I think you know, for Phoenix working so closely with our Keep Phoenix Beautiful um, affiliate, uh, you know, Phoenix has its own responsibilities as a, uh, a city's provi service provider. Uh, and then partnering those up where we align with Keep Phoenix Beautiful to do joint activities has always been very beneficial. Um, and, and so I think, I guess the other thing I'd highlight is look for those partnership opportunities with other organizations, and it doesn't have to be a, a keep, you know, America beautiful affiliate. Um, there are other organizations that are environmentally focused that may have aligned vision that you can coordinate with um, to get the messaging out um, and and uh, to do cleanup events and things like that. Thanks, thanks for that, Joe. I'm going to um, summarize here and wrap it up because we we have one minute left. But really quickly. What I heard here is, is important is there are lots of tools and tool chests, right? There are different ways to uh, really change behavior. It includes policy, it includes infrastructure, it includes education, it includes instilling community pride. But the true way to get that engagement and really grab people uh, must, all of you said the same thing, must be done community by community by community. It really is that, that personal connection, uh, that, that that sense of place that's really important to people uh, and how people consider their community, even whether it's a physical community like a neighborhood or a, uh, a, another thing that binds a community together like, like, a, like a church or a synagogue. That's the way, um, that's the way we're, gonna, we're gonna really address this problem across the board. Uh, thank you all. This is really very informative. I think it was a, a fabulous, uh, it was really fabulous to get all of your perspectives on this issue. Um, and with that, I will just say um, to the audience, thank you again, and please uh, join us for our next webinar series in the fall that's going to be talking about recycling. Thank you all. Thanks. I feel like we need like four hours to answer everyone's no. questions and chat. So thank you all for being so engaged. Yep. Thanks, everyone. We had a great time. Please feel free to reach out via email if you all have any more questions.